Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find the RCE um, podcast online at rce-cast.com. You can also follow me personally on Twitter, where I tweet about HPC and computer-related things. Uh, all one word, Brock Palin. And you can also find that linked on our website. Again, also, I have Jeff Squires from Cisco Systems. He's also one of the authors and organizers of OpenMPI. So, Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. How's it going? Uh, people can find me on Twitter as well, Jeff Squires. I, I tweet not very frequently, uh, but I, I did recently. Every, every once in a while when something grabs my eye. I'm not a regular tweeter, but I do. But I, I do try to write in uh, my blog at least once a week or so. So all that's linked off uh, the website. I guess uh, other shout-outs we should give. Uh, by the time this goes to air, I think – Euro MPI starts about a week after this goes to air, so be looking for interesting uh, research results to come out of that. That's always a cool conference. Yeah, and for everyone else in the HPC community, especially those of us in the state, uh, the big one, supercomputing, is coming up in November, so we're, we're only a little more than a month away from that. So I will be there. Jeff, I assume you will be there? Uh, yes, I'll be there, and I, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be doing the rounds. Yep, yep. Be looking around for the normal listeners and former guests we've had. So, again, SE is always a lot of fun. It always puts me to sleep, though, too, afterwards. I need to take a vacation <laughs> after SC. It is it is exhausting. And then right after that is Thanksgiving, where you're inevitably descended upon by family. So no risk for the wicked even after supercomputing. So our, our guest today, it, it's funny. I actually tweeted once that, I wished more software providers included modules, which we will get into, <laughs> modules with their software packages, uh, and so we wouldn't have to write so many ourselves. But we have with us today... Sorry, and modules with a, with a very specific meaning, not the generic software module meaning, but a very specific software package. Yeah, not Fortran modules, no other type of modules. This is environment modules, I think is what some people call them to clarify it. But our guest is uh, R.K. Owen, and R.K. is actually his initials, but uh, R.K. is joining us from the Pacific Coast. So, R.K., thanks for your time. Well, thanks very much, uh, Brock and uh, Jeff. Uh, I appreciate uh, you know being here today, and uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I currently work at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, uh, part of the NERSC, or the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. Uh, it's a division there. I'm originally a physicist by training, but I found that I enjoy uh, software far more than doing the physics, so I've kind of uh, gravitated uh, towards that, and uh, and so I've been kind of part of the maintaining the modules uh, for several years now. So for those of us who are not familiar with uh, modules, what, what exactly are they and what do they accomplish? Well, first of all, uh, yeah, I kind of identify them as environment modules because, as you know, modules is kind of an overloaded uh, term. Uh, I mean, there's kernel modules, Perl modules, Python modules, and I think you mentioned like Fortran modules. And uh, but, but I think uh, this kind of got there first, uh, uh, and it was originally identified uh, just as modules. But uh, more correctly, it's environment mo modules. And what it does is it allows a user to easily manipulate their user environment, uh, that being like the uh, you have environment variables like path, man path, LD, library path, and so on and so forth. And so it allows you to uh, kind of change those on the fly. And also you can uh, create aliases for... If you, have, if you run in like in the seashell or born shell, you, you have kind of a unified way where you can create an alias uh, in those shells. And uh, kind of a side benefit, it also uh, will modify X11 window resources too. Now, Brock and I are both uh, longtime environment module users. I, I think uh, we've exchanged some emails even many years ago in my prior life as a research assistant back at Indiana University and possibly even way back in, in, in my Notre Dame days. Um, but one of the, the genius things that I love about environment modules from a user perspective is that it can add and remove things from your environment. Even if, for example, some path is in the middle of your dollar path environment and you can say, oh, yes, well, you know, unload that package and environment modules will just go and find it in the middle 
of the path and remove it. And to me, that was always a a wonderful, wonderful thing for uh, particularly for users who don't know or care how all that mojo works. They just want to say, I, I don't want that in my environment anymore. Was that a specific design goal? I think, uh, yeah, the original design was to be as flexible as possible you know, with uh, dealing with these environment variables. And so I think it had always been designed with that uh, goal where if you had uh, you know, some entry in a path that was like in the middle, that it was, would be a, easily could extract it, remove it. But you'll find that most of the module commands uh, themselves uh, do things like you prepend to the path or you append to the path. And, uh, and that's kind of the, like, if, you, if you're if you calling upon a new, you know, you want to instantiate a, a new application in your environment, generally that module file will be appending onto your path. And you do a number of these things and say, then you want to remove it, then you do a module remove, then it'll extract it from a path wherever it may be. So... Uh, on traditional Unix and Linux type systems, we've always just modified the the dot files, you know, dot bashrc, dot cshrc. So besides removing um, entries from the middle of your path, what's some of the other benefits of modules over using the dot files? Well, in the dot files, uh, I mean, you, you're still free to use them uh, wherever. Uh, that's what's nice about modules is that you're not locked into one thing or the other. Well, the thing about dot .files is that it's fine for people where you have a, a very much a static environment. You know, you have your uh, a set number of uh, few applications that you want to use. Well, with so you could put that stuff in the dot .files uh, just as well. Uh, however, with modules, what's kind of nice about it is that uh, you can have... You know, if you need uh, to use some application today, but you don't need to use it tomorrow, uh, instead of kind of having it litter your, your your environment, you can just say, well, module load uh, application one here. And then that will put in your environment, and you can start using it. And But tomorrow, you don't want to have it. You don't want it in your environment. Or if you uh, say you're trying out some uh, some new application, and uh, or you want to uh, trade between two applications uh, or two versions of the same application. So modules allows you to load one, try it out, unload it, load the other application or the other version, try that out, and uh, you know, so you can go back and forth very easily. Now, one thing also that modules does, which I kind of kind of like, is that. Uh, it allows a person or a system administrator uh, to kind of place their applications in in its own root. And like for me, I usually put every put my application under user local package, and then the package name, and then version number. And so you don't have to just dump everything into user local bin, which is which has been us- the usual way of doing things. Now that is is a good thing and allows multiple concurrent versions of of the same software package, for example, or or multiple different builds for whatever reason, maybe based on architecture or configuration or something like that. But one of the criticisms of environment modules that I've heard over the years is that, well, you know, I get this ginormous path that's terrible, blah blah blah. Uh, what uh, what do you say to to people who give that kind of complaint? Well, uh, well, I agree with them in that it can give a, a very large uh, path, and and I know like most of the work, uh, or, or I was kind of introduced with uh, modules on Craze, and uh, and even now they separate, they segment uh, their applications uh, a lot using uh, modules, and yes, the path can be horrendously long. Uh, there's no doubt about that. However, the flip side is, well, then you have everything in user local bin. And so what's the best way of doing that? Well, I'd say it's easier to manage your, uh, your applications uh, using the modules or, you know, the path, uh, different paths, than it is to dump everything in user local bin. 
and uh, and particularly if you're doing your own stuff and you're building stuff from tarballs, uh, it really is kind of nice to just create a, a simple module file, either if you're doing for the system or for yourself, and then just uh, load that, and then you have access to uh, the, the application that you're uh, you just uh, unloaded in the tarball. Yeah, I agree with that sentiment completely. I, I personally don't really care how long the path environment variable gets because it's just a heck of a lot easier logistical problem for me as a user to have the packages just that I want uh, versus the system administrator, exactly what you said, trying to manage 600,000 packages inside one directory tree like user bin. And, uh, you know, particularly if you want to have 10 versions of, say, oh, I don't know, a great software package like OpenMPI, um, it's, it gets really sticky to do that, to install that into one tree. And Red Hat and others have come up with some fairly creative solutions for it, you know, the whole alternatives package and so on. But uh, to me, you know, I've logged in HPC clusters where I've seen, you know, 20 different MPI implementations, OpenMPI and otherwise, and, uh, boy, that's just uh, terrible to do, in my humble opinion, uh, via alternatives and much better served via, via modules. So that's just my two cents. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, I, I do all the user support, um, the software-facing stuff at our site. And I think at one time we had 30 different MPIs. <laughs> and so when you can, can include all the permutations of... Uh, versions and compiler versions. I mean, MPI is a good example. Compilers are a good example. Uh, but another case actually is is just the idea of reproducibility. You can say I did everything with version X, but that might not be that version that, say, a collaborator uses or something like that. And so it's it's nice to be very explicit and to be able to support many users in a large environment. With modules, it's just significantly easier. Yeah, you definitely need to. Uh yeah, you know, like, especially with libraries, you need to have a, a number of them because not every application uh, can use the latest, greatest uh, version of the library. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, sometimes you just have to go backwards, and this makes it easy to go. So one one thing is like we were really talking about HPC centers, and I know I've seen it in a lot of places. How how widely adopted is modules? How many places have you seen it at? Well, I've seen it uh, wherever you have craze, uh, you know, craze have them uh, native, natively. And, uh, yeah, it seems like every place I've been to, well, of course, uh, yeah, I kind of push to have uh, modules there. <laughs> also, I noticed that uh, Lawrence Berkeley Labs, uh, you know, with all my help, uh, they uh, you know, had modules installed there because they actually had a lot of, applications that they had to serve up. So where outside the HPC environment do you see uptake of, of modules, or is that not something you really pay attention to? No, I'm not really, uh, I'm not out there looking at uh, other places too much. Uh, however, uh, I would like to see it on uh, you know, a modules package uh, uh, installable on, say, Debian or Ubuntu, I think uh, yeah, SUSE uh, of Linux has it. Uh, uh, Red Hat, I'm not sure. But yeah, yeah, I think it would be nice if uh, it was available, but maybe you know, as an optional uh, package that a person could install. Because where where really where where I kind of got into this was uh, yeah, I was a software developer. I needed to have access to different applications and different libraries, and I wanted a way to kind of manage it on my system. And uh, and so I I noticed that uh, Craze had this uh, neat thing called modules. At first, I thought uh, when I was told about it, just the idea that uh, yeah, it was a child process modifying a parent process. So I said, well, that's I didn't like that idea because I thought it would be nothing but trouble. Uh, it would be just specific to craze. But when I found out more about it, uh, how it did it, that uh, I said, oh, I had to have it on uh, my box. And that's when I downloaded the 3.0 beta uh, version of the software and I had to go through quite a few hoops uh, to get it to compile. 
And then once I got it to, to compile and work uh, mostly pretty well, then I uh, went to the email list and uh, kind of announced that I have it. It's available for other people to download because at that point it seemed like uh, modules was kind of getting stagnant. There was nothing really happening for several years before that. And this was about uh, 1999. So you found that you know Cray had this modules package and you wanted to expand it to other places. Even to this day, who do you think should be using modules that you don't think is? Uh, well, like as I say, the uh, it should be a package available for like Ubuntu, Debian, Red Hat, any any place here, because you know, who it's really targeted at, I, the way I see it, is well the system administrator, you know, so they can manage your you know, various uh, or uh, selection of applications, and also for the software developer who needs access to you know different set of libraries or different set of tools, uh, depending on whatever project that they're working on. So I guess this is kind of an open call to uh, packagers out there. If anybody's interested in making a modules package, please uh, contact them, and they would love to talk to you. <laughs> Well, in fact, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to make it as easy as possible. Uh, I did have a Red Hat package, uh, or I, I have the hooks in it uh, in the uh, in the uh, sources themselves for to do a Red Hat package. And right now, I'm also working on a Ubuntu package because that happens to be the you know the system I use most often. Yeah, you. Years ago, I, I believe that uh, I made a, a package of modules for the Oscar. There was a, a cluster distribution at the time called Oscar, and uh, I made some RPMs for that. And apparently, they lived for quite a long time, even after I moved on and out of the uh, the Oscar project. But they were uh, quite useful there because I added a, another layer on top of modules for persistence across uh, multiple nodes. So it, it actually did you know, modify your dot files and things like that. So you could say, hey, choose this version of MPI, and that would actually not just modify your current environment, but also your startup environment because you kind of needed that in a, in a parallel environment. And I think we went back and forth on that a couple times on the mailing list a bunch of years ago. Okay. Well, there's also one feature of modules is that uh, if you have, uh, like in your home directory, uh, a dot module RC, in there you can have it do a module load of uh, whatever modules you commonly use and the module command itself will edit that file and so you can put common uh, commonly used uh, modules in that one file and it'll be accessible whether you you know boot or log in with a c shell or born shell or k shell or whatever well, I'm going to pretend that that feature wasn't there and that the work that I did a couple of years ago was uh, useful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you look at uh, uh, some of the things I have in the module sources, there are actually scripts and whatever that, uh, uh, that I had to develop for my job because uh, we had this kind of a segment between the user services and the system administration, and that was more on the user services. So we could do things to use your uh, dot files, but we couldn't do things to the system dot files, you know, that would make it uh, modules or whatever available for everybody. So, yeah, you'll find that there's a lot of uh, scripts and uh, craft in the module sources which are solving problems just like that. So this seems like a good segue here. What language is, is modules written in and why? It's written in C and it has a, an embedded TCL interpreter. Uh, I think, uh, well, originally the first version uh, written by John Furlan used aux scripts, and they found that uh, it's just too slow for them. And so I think what they did is they went to C uh, because it would be a lot faster, and they used the, the TCL uh, embedded interpreter because at the time that was kind of the only thing that was available. Now, if I was to write uh, modules today, I'd probably use C and embed a Perl interpreter, but that's just my preference. So that's a very interesting comment. Why why Perl? Is Perl just kind of your 
favorite language du jour or is there something that lends itself to modules or, or what's your rationale for saying that? Well, I think uh, the reason I would choose uh, Perl for, my, for myself, it's, uh, it's, it's the scripting language that I'm most familiar with. I do uh, a lot of not most of my work in Perl. However, uh, the modules uh, was written with the embedded uh, TCL because at the time that was the only embedded interpreter that was, uh, well, for the most part, in, uh, available. And it did have the promise of being kind of glue for, I mean, it, the glue to kind of glue different uh, applications together like that. However, uh, one of the things I would, I'm sort of, toying with an idea is the module command right now it uses TCL but there's really no reason that you can't embed other in, uh, interpreters also like Perl, Python, even M4 if you want uh, as long as that there's uh, some way to embed it and, and perform the few actions that you need to uh, like initialize the the interpreter and perform the few actions which are required for modules, then there would be really no reason why a Perl module or why a module file uh, couldn't be written in TCL or Perl or Python because they'd all be doing the same thing and basically uh, in letting the module command, giving the module command the information that it needs in order to modify the environment. Uh, for the user. So do you, is this any, anything more than a little twinkle in your eye right now? Is this something that we can expect in a future version? Well, if I had uh, infinite amount of time, uh, yes, but uh, <laughs> of no, course. it is something that I'm uh, working towards and mostly by rewriting the code to be more module. Uh, you know, there we go with the module uh word again, but modularize it so that it is less de dependent on TCL specifics, but allow other interpreters to be embedded. So it's something that I'm working towards. Uh, with the 3.3 version, which has been in the works for quite a while now, uh, it probably won't happen there, but, it's, but each iteration, the code gets cleaner, more concise. And I wouldn't be surprised, like, with 3.4, maybe. Uh, that, probably that would be my goal for 3.4 is to allow other interpreters to be embedded. So modules has this base feature of manipulating your environment. What is your personal favorite feature of modules? Well, I think my favorite feature is kind of the, or the one that I use most often is the prepend path. Uh, module directive because that's the one I use in all my module files because I just want to prepend something to my path. Uh, and in the times past, like uh, on various machines, uh, I would use this. And also, the other feature I like is the use.own module uh, file. That way, you can basically add your own set of module files. And that way I can tailor my environment because, like, uh, you know, on previous systems, uh, for whatever reason, the, the system uh, tools were really pretty inadequate, and they'd rather use GNU tools. And so I would either the GNU tools were available in, in a different directory or I'd compile them myself and put it under my home directory somewhere. And so using the prepend path and the... Uh, to use that own module file, I could use, you know, I could use GNU tools and uh, bypass whatever system tools that they had available. So it sounds like there's been a lot of modification out there. Jeff did some modification. It reminded me of some modification. Uh, how flexible is the, like the modules environment for modules itself? For modules themselves. Uh, now, that was one of the things that I introduced uh, with version 3.1 was versioning for modules themselves or in the module uh, command. 
because up to that point, you had modules could swap in and out to different versions of, say, an application, but it never had a, a way to swap in and out to, uh, basically a version of itself. And so with 3.1, and introduce all the kind of the framework and mechanisms so that uh, I could be working on modules 3.15 and on the system you, you could the native or the system could be defaulting to 3.14 and so that allowed me to kind of switch between the module uh, the application itself or tool to different versions so I can try out and make sure that the next version or the next yeah the next version was working appropriately so but module files themselves you're kind of locked into a certain framework at this time that may change in the in the in the future though yeah, with some ideas that I've, I've been floating around so I know I've got some really large module files What's what's the most complicated module file you've ever seen personally? Well, I, I I've seen a few uh, from the email list, and quite frankly, if a module file is too complicated, yeah, in the sense that it's uh, trying to do too many different things, uh, too many conditionals, it's you're probably doing something wrong, and so. Quite frankly, a module file should be fairly simple and uh, fairly uh, direct in that basically adding on to, you know, the path, the man path, the LD library path, uh, settings, other environment variables like the C flags or whatever. If it's doing something more complicated than that, it's, you yeah, perhaps you should probably rethink what you're doing or maybe break it up into different module files. Yeah, I remember oh. back in my uh, my Notre Dame graduate student days in the HPC and the centralized IT stuff, they had some absolutely monster module files that had all kinds of logic, and they would load sub-module files conditionally and do some some crazy things like that. Brock, what do you what do you have large module files for? What are you doing with them? The main ones are actually for certain libraries, like IMSL is a good example. Um, they come with a dot .file or something that you can source in your dot .file, but it just sets you know 20 different environments. Oh, I see. So you're not doing anything crazy. You're just setting a truckload of variables. Okay. Yep, yep. Probably the most craziest thing we do is you know, check to see if something else is loaded and maybe load it for you. Okay, so does modules have anything built in that keeps me from, say, loading two versions of the same piece of software multiple times? Well, I'm glad that you asked that because, uh, yeah, there is a feature which is native to the modules, or environment modules, is that uh, it's called uh, conflict and require. And so, so typically if you have multiple versions of the same application or same library, and you don't want them all to be loaded because, quite frankly, uh, if you have two different uh, versions of the uh, Open uh, MPI library, then you have kind of a, a problem because which one will get used? It'll, the first one in the in the uh, in the list on the LD library path list. So what you want to do is like if you have uh, module files for different versions of the same library. You would put in there a conf conflict, and so in this case, say the 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 module file named is uh, Open MPI, and then you have version I don't know 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Then in the module file itself, you'd say conflict Open MPI. So so the first time you load the module, uh, a Open MPI module, uh, that will get loaded. Fine, no problem. Then, if you say load open MPI slash 1.3, it'll say, "Oh, sorry, can't can't do that. Uh, it conflicts." Now, also, there's the other feature of requires, and so 
say, uh, I'm not sure what Open MPI would uh, require, but uh, say it required, uh, uh, say, Autoconf for whatever reason. You could say require Autoconf. But, uh, and then I think it'll, uh, no, it'll tell you that, oh, it can't load the module because it doesn't have all the required ones. But what you, what you can also do is have one module file which will do a module load of a whole string of things. And, uh, so that way, with one with one module file, you're actually setting up a, your entire uh, develop, developer in, environment. Cool. All right. Well, on a slightly different vein, we we asked you, you know, what's the largest, most complicated module file usage you've seen? What's the strangest use of a module file that you've seen? Well, I think the. Uh, on the email list, uh, we often get uh, questions from from people saying, "Well, this application has a uh, a script that needs to to be run, and then they, they try and cor course uh, module files in order to run this script." Uh, generally, yeah, you shouldn't do that because essentially the script is trying to do what module files uh, is supposed to be doing. And that is basically setting up your environment. So oftentimes it's just uh, far easier or far better if you look at the script, see what it's trying to do, and if it's setting you know, certain environment variables or doing you know, certain, I don't know, uh, actions, put it into a module file. And uh, but so those are kind of the strangest and kind of weirdest things, but uh, for the most part, uh, most people just use uh, module files uh, or modules for what it's intended, and that is basically modifying the environment. So if I'm a, say I'm a software developer, say like I'm in Jeff's position and I want to include a module file with my source, but I don't know what I should do or the intelligent way to do something being a first-time user. Uh, if I wanted to get some help making that module, can I get any? Uh, yes, uh, there is uh, an email list. Uh, I think it's called modules-interest at uh, sf.net or sourceforge.net. Uh, and there's actually quite a few people uh, who uh, uh, look at the email list. And they actually are very good about answering questions. And, and they actually do a far better job of answering questions uh, than I do. Uh, because I think they have more of a beat on what modules are, uh, especially in their own environment, in their own uh, situation. And uh, so many questions come in, and I've never seen one just kind of drop through the cracks yet. And so, yeah, and because that's also, it's an interesting question because I don't really recall any software providers uh, or developers really asking for help. Because I think modules are fairly straightforward in the sense that, uh, you know, if you want to add uh, your own module file, it's pretty straightforward in that you you look in the module's home and the module's path, and you can discover pretty much where things are being placed on the system. And so it may be that uh, most software developers, if they do want to add a module file, haven't really... Uh, really needed help yet, and, but if they do, uh, as I say, the module's uh, email list is very helpful, and of course, uh, I'm very willing to help out anyone, particularly if they want to add modules uh, to their package uh, to make it uh, more available. So what's coming up in, in future versions of the module software package? What new features are you doing? What are, what are people asking for and, and things like that? You talked about uh, new language interpreters, which I think would be personally awesome because I, I never remember the syntax for TCL because this is the only context in which I need it. So, you know, something like a Perl language interpreter, I'll give you a plus one on that one uh, right here. But what, what else is coming down the pike? All right, so I've got the 3.3 line out there uh, uh, just waiting to go. And uh, what it has is uh, internationalization. And also, I think what I want to add is something uh, like module reference counting. Now, there's also a TCL version of modules, which uh, 
I don't really have much to do with, but it's part of the uh, the uh, uh, CVS uh, repository, and they are they already have module reference counting there. But it's something that it's a good idea, and I want to add it to the uh, the C version, and also uh, add some module file directives for creating stacks uh, in in the environment, uh, so you can have a value and then pop it off uh, this environment, uh, some sort of environment variable stack. Also, uh, I'm going to kind of kind of remove some cruft that's uh, in the modules uh, command itself, like uh, module file caching. It was kind of an artifact of the 3.0 in that uh, at the time they used uh, caching to try and speed up uh, modules, but they also kind of kind of hampered uh, uh, the module environment by limiting it to two levels of directories. Uh, other things like well, tracing haven't really needed that at all, and also you know how to handle uh, uh, modules in like in a global home environment because. If you have a global home and you're logging on uh, with from three or four different machines, all with uh, different, uh, say, um, uh, uh, host operating system, then you have kind of a conflict with the module uh, purge uh, command. And as I said, the embedding other interpreters uh, or uh, allow them to be embedded. Um, and also just trying to package it uh, so that it'll be available for like uh, Ubuntu, Debian, perhaps uh, Red Hat. And also uh, another tool I would like to have is a uh, uh, TCL TK script that will basically help craft module files you know, from a template so that uh, for yourself, it's just a matter of uh, invoking a script and popping up a window and you can just click off that I want to add yeah, add this to path, man path, LD library path, um, whatever paths that you, you have there. Okay, RK, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, what's the website for modules? Uh, the the one that's uh, active is modules.sf.net. That's the uh, the website that's associated with uh, the SourceForge uh, repository, and that's the one that uh, you know, we keep up to date. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. All right, appreciate okay, it. Well, thank, thank you very you. much.